فتيات اليوم كفاكي تركاض الخلف سرابي عودي نحو الإسلام لا تستمعي لذئابي فالشرق دمار فيه والغرب عدو كتابي همه طمس الدين وكذا لفظا لترابي قتل الإنسانية How did this book shape the world? Before this book appeared, brothers and sisters, the situation, the condition of the world was such that even Pope Gregory the Great, a contemporary of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, writing in Rome in the year 590 CE, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was 20 years of age, he writes that wherever we see in the world, we see oppression and tyranny and injustice. And everywhere we see chaos and catastrophes. And the divine justice is not to be seen anywhere. When will, when will this divine justice come? He's lamenting. He's longing for this divine justice to come, to rescue the world from the situation it's facing at the time. And soon after, not very long after, this man, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, received a revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam You were not sent except as a mercy for the world as a mercy for the world and then Allah, God tells this messenger of Allah in this book that you are to change the landscape the socio-political landscape of this world. You are, changed, you are to change the existing political order, which is tyrannical and oppressive. You are to rescue the people of this world. You need to go out and bring these people to life, as the book of Isaiah in the Bible tells us. The Quran tells us that this messenger was foretold in the previous scriptures. Well, in Jesus, this messenger, this prophet, he was mentioned in the previous scripture. You will find him there. Allahu Akbar. So the ulama, our scholars, look into the Bible, in the previous scriptures. Where was he mentioned? We need to find out. We need to see whether there are any verses in this regard. And they go to the book of Isaiah which was revealed to the Prophet Isaiah 13 centuries before the Prophet of Islam was born. In this book, Isaiah was given a vision. He was told in, chap in the chapter 42 that there will come a man. He will bring a new law. He will come for the Gentiles as a light, not for the Jews. He will come for the Gentiles as a light. He will spread justice on the land. Ireland sh shall wait for his law. He will put idol worshippers to shame. He will build, bring people from darkness into light. And he will come from Arabia. He will be a messenger of God. And he will triumph over his enemies. Who is this man, brothers and sisters? Who is this man? He is coming from Arabia. He will put idol worshippers to shame. He will triumph over his enemies. He will bring a new law. He will spread, spread justice on earth. Christopher North, the top authority, one of the top authorities in the world on the topic of biblical commentary. And his speciality is the book of Isaiah. He wrote a book published by the Oxford University Press in the UK, titled The Suffering Servant in Deutero Isaiah, who wrote a commentary. He wrote, he wrote a commentary in this book on this very chapter. He states that this person Listen to me carefully. He states on page number 141, he states that this person who is being referred to in this very chapter is a prophet king. He is a messianic figure who will bring a comprehensive way of life, who will have temporal power as well as spiritual power. And he will bring something like the Arab deen, like Islam. Allahu Akbar. And he's not a Muslim. He's not a Muslim. So this person was foretold. And the shaking of the world, which 
which took place in the 7th century was foretold in the book of Isaiah, chapter 42, word by word fulfilled in the advent of the Prophet of Islam, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now this messenger appears, having been foretold in the previous scriptures. And when the Jews like Abdullah bin Salam see him, talk to him, recognize him, they embrace Islam. When Christians like Uday bin Hatim see him, recognize him, they embrace Islam. When Waqa, Waqa bin Nofu, a man of scriptures, hears the story of this angel coming down, Iqra bismi rabbi kalladhi khalaq, khalaq al-insana min alaq, whereby the Prophet sallallahu responded by saying, ma ana bin qari'in, he said to the angel, I don't, I don't know how to read. The, the angel said, read, and he said, I don't know how to read. And again, we go to the book of Isaiah, chapter 29, verse 12, it is foretold, when the book is given to the one who is not learned, when the book is given to the one who is not learned, it is said to him, read, and he will say, I am not learned. I am not learned. Thirteen centuries before the Prophet of Islam was born, this is what is stated in the book of Isaiah, chapter 29, verse 12. And one of the most ancient manuscripts of this particular book can be found in the Jerusalem Museum in Palestine, in Jerusalem. And this can be found in a scroll called the scroll of Isaiah, Isaiah Q1. And the scroll was written five centuries before the Prophet was born by the Dead Sea uh, community. So brothers and sisters, we are told that this person, when the book is given to the one who is not learned, Ummi, he is Ummi, he is not learned, he is unlettered, he is not illiterate, he is unlettered, doesn't know how to read and write. And it is said to him, read, and he will say, I am not learned. And when Waraka bin Nofal heard this story, what did he tell him? This is the same angel who came to Musa and then I wish I was alive on that day to protect you, to defend you. Allahu Akbar. This is the man who was foretold in the previous scriptures that he will come and shape the world forever and he will change the political order. He will rescue the people of this world and he will bring them to life. He will bring them to peace and justice as previously they were tyrannized, barbarized, and oppressed. And the Prophet sallallahu passed away in the year 632 CE. In the very next year, 633 CE, in the city of Toledo in Spain at the time, when the Catholics were governing the country, there was a decree issued by the church in the fourth council of Toledo, which took place in the year 632. 3 CE, and it was decided that all the Jews of Spain are to be gathered, and their children are to be taken away by force, and they are to be groomed as Christians in this country. All of them were forced into Christianity, according to this text. And then came Islam, then erupted the volcano of justice and peace in an Arabian village known as Mecca. Mecca was a village. It was a village. Are you all with me? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. I'm not convinced. <laughs> Are you sure? Yes. Now I am. This village, which was effectively a village, Mecca was not a cosmopolitan city. It was in the trading sense. But when it comes to sophistication and monuments and civilization, these people, they only had 17 people who could read and write in that city. These were people who used to bury their daughters alive. They used to try, take pride in fighting over pity things. If a sheep crossed into another people's land, they would fight over it for years, killing hundreds of people. These were people who were facing jahiliya, ignorance, and they were living in dark ages. And the whole world was witnessing dark ages. In Syria at the time, the Byzantines were governing, the Romans, Heraclius was the emperor, and they were oppressing their own Christian brothers. The Byzantines, the Romans followed a version of Christianity which is known as the Chalcedonian version of Christianity. And the Christians in the land of Syria were diverse when it comes to uh, doctrine. Some of them were Jacobites, other, other were historians, and some were orthodox, 
and the violent teachers were forcing their view on these minor sects, these minor sects of Christianity. And Jews were being annihilated. Some Jewish scholars, some Jewish historians argue that Jews were saved from extinction by Islam. When Islam came to power, Islam gave these Jews that justice and peace which was necessary for their existence. So brothers and sisters, the point is, how did this book shake the world? How did this advent of a prophet in the middle of the Arabian desert shake the world? This is the question. How did he change the situation of mankind? When he's besieged in the city of Medina, an army of 10,000 men, Ghazwatul Ahzab, the Battle of Thunder, when a ditch was dug around the city of Medina, or the village of Medina, it was a village. Go to any village in the outskirts of Roman Bindi, and you will see exactly what I'm talking about. This is how Medina was at the time. An army of 10,000 men is, is, is besieging the city. And when they're digging the ditch, a row up appears. And they cannot break it, they ask the Prophet to come and break it. The Prophet strikes the rock and a spark comes out. And he says, Allahu Akbar. At another time, he strikes the rock and he says, Allahu Akbar. The third time he strikes the rock and the rock shatters. And he says, Allahu Akbar. And a spark appears. The companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked Ya Rasulullah. Why did you say Allah Akbar every time a spark appeared? He said, He said that the first time when the spark appeared, Allah gave me the glad tiding of a victory over the Arabs. And the second time Allah told me about a victory over the Persians, the superpower, a power with an army of 150,000 men. And then the third time Allah gave me a news of a victory over the Byzantines, the Romans, a power with an army of 240,000 men. And the Sahaba, the companions, they were dumbstruck. They were flabbergasted. We will have a victory over the Arabs, the Persians, and the Byzantines, and we don't even know if we're going to be alive tomorrow. An army of 10,000 men is coming to besiege us. We can't even go to the toilet. We are so fearful. And this man, the Messenger of Allah is telling us that you will not only survive this, you will go out there and do this. Allahu Akbar. The hypocrites of the time, the Munafiqun, those who pretended to believe in Islam, they were laughing. I think this man has lost his mind. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And those who were the believers, they believed. They said, the Prophet said it, it will happen. And what happened, brothers and sisters of Islam? What happened? What happened? Can anyone help me? Anyone? Put your hand up. No one is brave enough to tell me what happened? Okay, let me tell you what happened. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed away in the year 632 CE. And this promise he made to his companions was fulfilled to the letter. In the Quran, chapter 24, verse 55, we are told, and so were the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, It is a promise of Allah to those who believe among you, and do righteous deeds, that Allah will grant you succession in the land over the present rulers. You will overpower the present political system. You will defeat the current political and tyrannical powers. And this promise was fulfilled because it was a promise and a promise made by Allah. And the Prophet Sallallahu passed away in the year 632 CE, the year 11 Hijri. And exactly a century later, exactly a century later, in the year 732 CE, the Messenger of Allah's promise and the promise made by Allah in the Quran was fulfilled to the letter exactly a century later. Muslims, the Sahaba, the Tabi'een, and some of the Tabi'een had carved an empire on an unprecedented scale. Never before the history of mankind witnessed anything like it. Never before 
such a vast chunk of land was taken by one group of people in such a short span of time. They were governing a land stretching, uh, stretching as far as northern China and northern France, 300 miles away from Paris in the year 732 CE. And the impact was so huge that in England at the time, being the venerable, one of the Anglo-Saxon historians writes that the Saracens, the Muslims, are around the corner, not very far away from us. And in the south, they are in Hind, which was known as Hind at the time. Muhammad and Qasim landed in Sind, and within no time, he was in Multan. And hence, you are all believers. Hence, you are all believers. Someone was bothered enough to come out. Someone was caring enough to come out and take Islam to your ancestors and your predecessors. I'm assuming that most of you originate from this, this land. Most of you and your ancestors were born here. And most of them were not Muslims. Someone was caring enough to bring Islam to them. And now what happens? Now what happens? These people have taken all of this land. What happens now? How did this book shook the, uh, shake the world? What was so positive and good about this empire which was carved by these people? Let me tell you, and let me narrate the story. Before I even go to the end, what happened in the end? What did the poet say? This was the beginning. Why? Because Allah told them in the Quran, you the believers, you are the ones who will establish peace in the world. As the book of Isaiah chapter 42 said, that this person, this prophet, who will come from Arabia, will spread justice on earth, and his enemies will fail against him. They won't be able to defeat him. And now the Quran tells these people, Kuntum khayra ummatin, nas, you are the people who will spread justice and peace. You are the best of people, chosen for the people. You will bring good to people and you will forbid them from evil. And then in another place, Allah tells, about, tells these people to go and rescue those who are oppressed. For example, for example, what is wrong with you believers, you Muslims, the companions of Prophet Muhammad that you go out and fight for those oppressed men, women and children who scream for the help of Allah. They're saying, oh Allah, rescue us, rescue us, send an army for us to rescue us. And an army was sent indeed, an army was sent. An army which was ill-equipped, not capable of doing the job they did. Materially, they were nil. They were insignificant, unimportant. The Byzantines, the Persians, they didn't even care about them. They didn't want them, these brethren, semi-barbarized or semi-civilized people. We don't want to know that they have nothing except camels and sheep. We don't want them. But these people, they rose to such a level of piety, dignity and honor from, from a level of such depravity and lowliness to such a high status of honor and dignity that they were able to take on all these powers simultaneously at the same time. If I was to tell you today, if I was to tell you, to give you an example, to give you a taste of what happened, and then I will quote some academics, Western academics in due course, what they have to say about this phenomenon. I was to tell you today that a village in Rawalpindi or Peshawar or one of the villages here, here or there anywhere, will rise to such a power that they will simultaneously challenge the Chinese, the Russians, and the Americans and defeat them simultaneously. A village in Pakistan somewhere. Okay? They will challenge the Chinese, the Russians, and the Americans simultaneously, and they will defeat them. 
What will you do to me? You're all doctors. You're all potential doctors, inshallah. You will take me to the clinic <laughs> and you'll sit me down and you'll do a checkup. This man, he needs some kind of psychological support. <laughs> he's psychopathic. Okay, he's a psychopath. He's lost his mind. He's telling us our village will rise to such power and it will defeat the Chinese and the Russians and the Americans. Okay, this is what the Prophet was telling his companions. And this is why, you see, some of the academics, such as Carol Hillenbrand from the University of Edinburgh, she's an expert. She's a, an authority in this field, the early Islamic conquest. She states, and I quote, that much ink has been spilt on this phenomenon. Much ink has been spilt, much has been written. No firm conclusions to this day have, uh, have been withdrawn, have been drawn. We don't know to this day how it happened. It was a miracle, it was a phenomenon. Lawrence I. Conrad, again a historian from America, he states that we don't know how this happened in such a short span of time. Then, another historian, Gerald Horton, from the School of Oriental and African Studies, he states, we don't know how it happened. We don't have any theories, any explanation as to how this took place. A miracle indeed. Allah told these believers in the Quran, do not fear, do not despair. You will be victorious if you are believers. If you are believers, and believers they were indeed, and they rose, they confronted the Persians in the battle of Qadisiyah. 12,000 fighting 150,000. They were victorious. In the battle of La Junda in Spain, Tariq bin Zia facing 100,000 men with 12,000 men defeated. The battle of Yarmouk, 40,000 Sahaba facing an army of 240,000 men. They defeated them. They defeated them. The battle of Muta, 3,000 Muslims led by Khalid bin Walid face an army of 100,000 Romans and they rescue themselves. They come back to Medina in one piece. This was a phenomenal group of people which was produced by this book, the Quran. And these were the most disgraced people on the face of the earth. Ja'far bin Abi Talib, when he went to the court of Najashi, he said, we used to eat the dead. We used to kill our daughters. We used to find our petty things. We were a disgraced people. Islam came and gave us that sense of dignity and honor. Islam came and gave us that sense of dignity and honor. And Omar said, we were a disgraced people. We were a disgraced people. And Islam gave us that dignity, which made us what we are today. Allah Akbar. This book shook the world. And when these people went out, the lands opened the doors for them. The people of Persia, the people of Syria, the people of Egypt, they opened the doors for these people. The people of Spain, they opened the doors for the Muslims. You see, when Muslims went to Syria, Dionysius, a, Ro a Roman historian writing in the 9th century states, when the Muslims took the city for the first time, the Demosthenes, the people of Damascus, they put up a fight. They fought the Muslims, thinking that these barbarians from the desert, we don't know what they're going to do to us. They don't know them, they don't recognize them. When, when the Muslims come to power, to tell the Christians, you may live as you like. You can have your wine and your pig. Live in peace. No problem. Do not cause any trouble. Do not hinder the cause of peace and justice. And we won't put any pressure on you. And then the tax, the jizya was taken, which was one dinar per head, a very low amount, equivalent to about, about the price of a goat. Because in the Hadith literature, we learn that from one dinar one could buy one could buy a goat. So that was the tax for the whole year for those who could afford to pay. Laborers, old men, women, children, monks were exempted. And when the Romans came back to take the city of Damascus, Abu Ubaidah bin Jarrah, having known the numbers of his army, 300,000 men, led by Heracles the emperor, he's coming back to take back 
the land of Syria from the Muslims. Now Abu Ubaidah, he had to decide as to whether fight within the city or go out. If they fight inside the city, there's a danger of the city being massacred. There's a danger of a siege and we will be starved to submission. So now we go out and fight in an open pitch and leave the people of the city alone. Don't get them involved in this fight. And then Abu Ubaidah writes Dionysius. Dionysius states, a Christian historian, the reason why I'm not quoting Muslim historians is because one can turn around and say, well, Muslims, they will always think of a biased record, right? They will always praise themselves. They will say, yes, we were a great people, we were very nice, we were very kind, we were very just. We go to the other. We ask the other, what do you think about us? How did we treat you? Dionysius tells us, when Abu Ubaidah was withdrawing, he said to his people, his treasurer, to return the money, to return the jizya to the Christians of the city. Because we took this money from them to protect them. We tax them to protect them. We don't tax them to oppress them. And Dionysius states that people, the Christians, they were shocked. They were crying. How can these people, these semi-barbarized, semi-civilized people, come from the desert and treat us in this way? And our civilized brothers from Constantinople, the Byzantines, they treat us that they even go and take money from our coffers. What kind of people are they? And they were crying. And they were praying, Dionysius writes, they were praying for their return. Not the return of the Romans, the Byzantines, who were Christians, not them, them, the Muslims. And the Muslims had a battle in due course, the Battle of Yarmouk. Long story short, the Muslims are victorious. Alhamdulillah. They returned to the city of Damascus. Did the people fight this time? The question is, did the pe people fight this time? Dionysius states that people opened the gates of the city, the Christians, they came out and they embraced the Muslims with open arms and they were crying and they were praying and thanking God for the return of the Muslims. John of Nikil, another Christian Coptic Orthodox writer, writing in the, in the year 690 CE, writes that when the Muslims, led by Amr bin Asr anhu, landed in Egypt, the Coptic Christians joined the ranks of the Muslims against the Byzantines because they found the Muslims to be more merciful and just. Zion Zohar, an American historian, writes in his book, A History of Sephardic and Mitzrayi Jewry, on page 8 and 9, he states, when the Muslims landed on the Straits of Gibraltar in Spain, the Jews welcomed them as liberators from the Catholic persecution. This is how the Muslims shook the world, and they gave their social order to the world, which caused their existence or the cause, uh, they caused the, uh, the preservation of these societies. Before we go on any further, I want you to tell me whether you are awake or not. Yes. Are you paying, paying attention? Yes. What I'm talking about is not too complicated, is it? No. Are you sure? Yes. Okay. Will Durant, Will Durant, a philosopher who wrote a history of civilization in ten volumes. And on the first page of the first volume of his work titled Our Oriental Heritage, he states, he defines a civilization. He defines a civilization. He states, a civilization is made of four elements. Pay attention, please. Four elements economic provisions, political stability, pursuit of knowledge and arts, and moral traditions. Four elements. Economic provisions, political stability, pursuit of knowledge and arts, and moral traditions. And all of these four elements rest upon one pillar. All of these four elements rest upon one pillar. And that pillar is sense of security and justice. If you remove that pillar, if you remove that pillar from a society, none of these four elements will survive. None of these four elements will, will survive, they will collapse, because the central pillar which supports a civilization to come about is non-existent. Are you with me? Yes. Did you understand this? Yes. So justice is central to any civilization. 
If you remove justice, no civilization. What did Islam do? The first thing, Sharia, Islam did was to establish a pillar, justice, peace for all the masses, all people, regardless of color, creed, and race, regardless of their differences. So when the Muslim landed in these lands, they agreed, they, to, they agreed to terms with these people. They said to them, you may have what you like. Don't cause any disturbances, don't fight against us, don't cause any rebellions, and you may live in peace, have your religion, have your churches. And will do it states this, that pillar of justice and sense of security is central for a civilization to come about. What happened with the Muslims? How did they establish this civilization? How did they give that peace to the world? By having terms and treaties with the masses. The masses agreed to these terms and they lived in peace. For example, when the Prophet Sallallahu had a debate with the Christians of Najran, the Christians of Najran, they came and they debated him, the, him, debated him in the mosque on Christianity. And the Prophet gave the Quranic version about Jesus Christ. We believe Jesus is not the Son of God. We believe he is not God. We believe he is the messenger of God. They said the Christians, we don't believe that. We don't believe that. Now what? Are you going to kill us? The Prophet said, no. The treaty can be found in a book called Sutu al -Bazdar. And the treaty, which was agreed upon between the Prophet and these Christians, states, that the Christians of the land of Najran may live in peace. They are protected by Allah and His Messenger. Their crosses, their churches, their bishops, and all the religious settlements are protected by Allah and His Messenger. And the list goes on. When Jerusalem was taken by Amr bin Khattab in the year 15, Hijri, the patriarch of the city, the Christian patriarch, Sophronius, he said, I will give the keys to the king alone. Bring the king and take the keys. Omar came. Dionysius against the Roman historian writes, that Omar gave a blank check to Sophronius. You write the terms and I will sign them. And the terms can be found in the history of Imam Ibn Jirib, Ibn Jirib al -Tawari. The treaty goes that this is a protection given by Amir al-Mu'mineen Omar al khattab to the land of Palestine. Your crosses, your churches, your religion, everything is under the protection of Allah and His Messenger. You, as long as you live in peace, are allowed to live in peace. No religious pressure whatsoever will be put upon you. You will, will, you will be not coerced in the religious matters. And now the Treaty of Spain in the year 713 CE, Muslims died in Spain in the year 711 CE, and the treaty was offered. In this treaty, the son of Musa bin Nusayr is conversing with the Christian leader, Theodore, and the treaty states again, this is a protection granted by Allah as messenger, that you may live in peace with your religion, with your crosses, with your churches, and your churches will not be demolished, your houses will not be burnt, and your families will not be separated. And no religious pressure whatsoever will be put upon you. Justice, peace, tranquility, convivencia, coexistence. We exist together under one roof. Karen Armstrong. Do you know Karen Armstrong? Have you heard of her? Yes. She states in her book, a history of Jerusalem on the page number 240. She states that the Muslim in the history of mankind for the first time came up with a system which enabled the three Abrahamic faiths, the Jews, the Christians and the Muslims to live together in peace for the first time in the history of mankind. Karen Armstrong, a history of Jerusalem. Not a Muslim. Not a Muslim. Thomas Arnold, T.W. Arnold, he states that some of the minor Christian sects in Syria and in, in Egypt, they only survived because of the Muslim protection. When the Muslims came and gave the protection, they survived because of that. If it, was, if it was left for the Byzantines, they would have destroyed these people. Some of the Jewish historians, such as Heinrich Kreitz, a German Jewish historian, writes that Jews were saved from extinction by the Muslim threat by the Muslim arm. The Muslims came and rescued them from the annihilation and extinction they were facing. And the Jews themselves referred to the, the age of Al-Andalus, the age of Spain, when the Muslims governed Spain for more than seven centuries. They referred to this age as the golden age of the house of Israel. This is where the Jews were able to live in peace, to work and to write commentaries on Torah, this is where they produced people like Musa bin Maimun, 
Maimonides, who is known in the Jewish history as the second Moses. This is where they formed the Hebrew grammar based upon the Arabic model. This is where the best Jewish poets were born, writing in Arabic. Musa bin Maimon, Maimonides, he wrote a book, A Guide for the Perplexed, one of the best works of philosophy in Arabic language, in Kartaba, in the 11th century. That's how the Muslims protected the minorities and the other. And where did this principle come from? Where did this principle come from? From the Quran, chapter 5, Surah Al-Ma'idah, verse 8, Allah tells the Muslims, Oh, you believe, stand firmly for justice as witnesses to Allah, and do not mistreat the other, even if you dislike them, even if you dislike a people, do not avoid justice, be just, as Allah does not love the unjust. Allahu Akbar. This principle was given to the Muslims in the Quran. The Prophet of Islam وسلم, stated in Kitab al Jihad, Sahih al Bukhari, that anyone who harmed the Mu'ahid, anyone who harmed another, the other, for example, a Jew or a Christian who is living under the who is living under the protection of Islam, will not smell the fragrance of paradise. He will never see paradise if you harm such a person. Umar bin Khattar radiallahu anhu, again Kitab al Jihad, Sahih al Bukhari, on his deathbed, before he died, he stated, Whoever succeeds me as the Khalifa, beware about the rights of the Ahl al Do not put a burden upon the shoulders more than they can bear, and fight for them. Fight for them if you have to fight for them to protect them. The principles of Islam, that pillar of justice and equality which was given by Islam to its people, and this is what Bill Beard talks about, that if this pillar, sense of security and justice is removed, the entire civilization will collapse, which is happening right now, which is what we are witnessing right now in our own countries. Sense of security and justice, missing. Civilization is collapsing. We need to establish that sense of justice and security. And brothers and sisters, what then? Subsequently, how much time? Subsequently, what happened? You see, there's a theory, the philosophers propose a theory, and even Will Durant, he expands on this very principle. He states that when this sense of security and justice is established, the masses, the people are now free to carry out intellectual inquiries into the connecting principle of nature. Now they can sit down in peace and study. Now they can work for the common good of mankind. Are you with me or is this too much philosophy? Are you with me brothers and sisters? Yes. Am I making sense? Yes. When I said I'm making sense, your voice went down. <laughs> Am I making sense? Yes. Okay. So when Duran, he states that that justice is important for mankind to make progress. So what happens? There's a chain. There's a chain you have to remember, a very simple chain. Just remember this principle. Justice. Justice, which comes from the Quran. Chapter 5, verse 8. From justice comes peace. Okay? And from peace comes progress. From peace comes progress. Justice, peace, progress. Period. That's it. That's it. This is what the political philosophers have been telling us. You have justice, you will have peace, and then you will have progress. This is exactly what Islam did. And now, because of this justice and peace, which the Muslims disseminated in the world, everywhere they went, they gave that justice and peace to the world. They allowed the Christians and the Jews and the Zoroastrians and all the others to live in peace as long as they don't cause any havoc and chaos in the society. And now comes the civilization of Islam. The best civilization ever known in the history of mankind, according to some Western historians, according to George Saliva, according to George Sartre, according to A.C. Cromwell, according to, according to, and the list goes on. All these people tell us that the Muslims reached the pinnacle of civilization. The Muslims established such a peaceful civilization that never in the history of before and never after that anything like that was witnessed. Muslims allowed judicial autonomy to the minorities. Do you know what that means? Do you know what that means, brothers and sisters? That means that the Jews and the Christians were allowed to go to their court. The Christians had their own court. Allah has given them the right to 